This movement is bigger than me, older than me, longer than me. My passion is really about making black people powerful in the political process so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. Over 70 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. How important do you think it is to be having those difficult conversations? I actually think that the state of politics at play right now is extreme, right? Versus uh, not extreme. I think we can all agree that guns and badges don't address that problem. Even law enforcement can agree with that. I don't that. think we can all agree on that. I well, think you're making an over-assumption to say I that we can all agree I on I actually that. think that there are a lot of people out there that think that Black Lives Matter is coming to take something from you. But is that true? Twenty twenty saw the largest protest movement in US history. Black Lives Matter has gone mainstream. Patricia Cullors, Opal Tometi, and Alicia Garza are the original co founders of the movement. I sat down with Alicia to talk it all through, from her youngest years to the incredible progress for equity she's contributed to, to addressing her harshest critics. Um, are you guys good? Yeah. Yep. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Alicia, for sitting down with us. Why is it that with all the crap that 2020 has thrown at us? Oh my gosh, and there's been so much. There has been so Tell much. Tell me about it. Um, <laughs> why is it, do you think, that Black Lives Matter has taken on a life of its own and really just, there's something about it that has just really struck home this year? I think it's in the muscle memory now of this country. And I remember seven years ago, it was so hard for people to say Black Lives Matter. It was like taboo. Mm. It was like, I can't say that without saying everybody's life matters too. And it's like, of course, of course. But there are some lives that matter more than others. So we got to deal with that. Alicia grew up in a mixed race household. She moved to a mostly white Californian suburb when she was in middle school, where she inevitably stood out. From a young age, she was always cheering on the underdog. I always wonder with people like yourself, I mean, was it a politically active or aware household that you grew up in? Were there fights over the dinner table about what no. America was going to look like? No, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> that was definitely not happening in my house. Um, my parents were antique dealers. The antique dealers are a unique community of they people. They actually really are. It's yeah. very true. Growing up, I was used to being the only one. I was one of a few black kids in my school. I was one of a few black kids in my neighborhood. But I think what drives me in terms of my work is um, that feeling when you realize it's not just you. You were just 12 when you got into your first foray of organizing or activism when your school district was talking about whether or not to introduce contraception That's right. in schools. I mean, I think when I was 12, I didn't even know about contraception, didn't even know about sex, maybe. I mean, you must have been a very smart, capable young girl. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you and, see me. You know, I'm like, I'll take that. <laughs> and, you know, my mom talked to me a lot about sex growing up. She was like, sex makes babies and babies are expensive. And that was her experience <laughs> as a single mom for the first, you know, few years of my life. Um, and for me, I think that did really politicize me. Your mother died in 2018, I believe, and I know that she was very influential to you. Can you tell us a little bit about her and, and how she inspired you? My mom is my whole world. And yeah, losing her two years ago is probably the hardest thing I've ever gone through. I'm sorry. And, um, you know, my mom taught me everything I know. She would never watch somebody suffer and not try to help. Alicia followed her lead. She spent the last two decades in the trenches, advocating around everything from gentrification to workers' rights. In 2015, she was at a bar in Oakland as she watched the news. State of Florida versus George Zimmerman. Verdict, we the jury find George Zimmerman not guilty. George Zimmerman, the man who killed the black teenager Trayvon Martin, was acquitted. She wrote a passionate post, calling out the injustices that she saw and calling it a love letter to black people. 
It became a rallying cry. What was it about Trayvon Martin's case that, that hit you personally? Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old kid who, uh, during a break in a sports game, volunteered to go get snacks for his dad and his brother. And he ended up dead. And I think the thing that, for me, is unique about Trayvon's story is also the things that are not unique about it. He wasn't killed by a police officer. He was killed by a vigilante. There is all of these ways in which Black lives don't matter in this society. And it's not unique to the United States. It's a global problem. And I think that is why this has become a global movement. Black Americans are over three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. In 2020 alone, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, Daniel Prude, Rayshard Brooks, and many more have died at the hands of the cops. But it was the brutal killing of unarmed black man George Floyd in May which ignited the world. Black Lives Matter has grown and grown and grown and grown exponentially. This year in 2020, I think we've seen the biggest protest in US history. There has been an incredible outpouring, not just with black people, right? But everybody who is coming on board with the notion that we're not done. We haven't fixed this. Between May and June of 2020, the Black Lives Matter hashtag was tweeted over 47 million times. I've seen a lot of my newsfeed, at least, being filled to the brim with people doing their kind of online activism and being self-proclaimed activists, organizers, warriors. And I'm wondering if you think that that kind of trend for being super woke and um, kind of online activism has helped the movement or has hindered it? I think that it's complicated. When you think about people who have been left out and left behind for so long, of course there would be that yearning and desire in you to have a stage. It also reminds me that, I mean, even though social media can be the most toxic and horrendous place on earth, it is also incredible when it mobilizes movements like this. That's right. And so it's important to have these platforms, but it's also important to be responsible with them. You cannot cut corners towards social change. That is how we get people with Black Lives Matter signs in their windows, but they'll still cross the street if you're on the same side. It seemed like overnight this year, we saw so many corporations, city councils, schools, media corporations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sudden, <laughs> um, suddenly coming out and saying oh, Black Lives Matter and we're so on board with diversity and inclusion. And I mean, how sincere do you think that is? I mean, I might just be being a miserable journalistic cynic and thinking that, oh, maybe suddenly everyone does really care. <laughs> or, you know, it's not sincere and people are jumping on a trend. I'm not a cynic, but I also don't engage in magical thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are a lot of companies and platforms right now that chase trends. From March to May, the world got set on fire. All of a sudden, people were calling, like, I want to donate to Black Lives Matter. And I'd be like, OK, but that's not what I do anymore. They'd be like, oh my God, but I don't care what you do, anything having to do with Black people, you know? And it's like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. <laughs> But look, it's not that complicated to um, make sure that you hire black people at all levels, um, that, that the only role that black people are playing in your company is either administrative or diversity specialists. Like, that's a problem. Black people make up almost 14% of the US population, but they're still underrepresented in leadership roles in most industries. Out of all the Fortune 500 CEOs, only four are black. There are no black women. Us media folk are also falling behind. Only 17% of staff at print and online publications are not white. Alicia is working to correct this. You recently wrote a book, Purpose of Power. I will bring it up. 
<laughs> I'm like, I have succeeded. I have not once said, You did so in well. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to check page 35. <laughs> um, it, which is essentially like a, I, I mean, it's an, a history, but it's also a practical guide for kind of organizing movements. And in it, you write, you don't just add water, oil, and milk to pre-mix batter, which is, by the way, not how I make a cake. <laughs> After 30 minutes in the oven, a movement is baked. And then you go on to kind of give your tips for building a movement. Who did you write the book for? I wrote this book because I wanted to demystify what it means to be an activist, what it means to be an organizer. And I wanted us to get clear about what is the purpose of movement building. Oftentimes, people will ask me things like, there's this thing I really care about, and how do I turn my hashtag into a movement, like the one that you've created? And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, this movement is bigger than me, older than me, longer than me. But second of all, hashtags don't do that. People do that. Everybody can, get involved. can be a part of social change, and it doesn't require you to be superhuman. It just requires you to care enough to do something about the things mm -hmm. that you don't like in your life. If you get arrested and you want to be accounted for, write this number down. This number will account for you and put you in touch with pro bono legal services. For people who you know, might want to get involved in activism but are super intimidated, because I think it can be an intimidating place, and especially for someone without your budding confidence at such a young age. So, I mean, for those individuals, like, what's your best advice for getting, in, getting started? If you don't actually believe change can happen, this is not the place where you should engage. Right. <laughs> this work is not fun, it's not glamorous, it's not sexy, like it's hard. We live in segregated communities, we work in segregated workplaces, uh, even our democracy is segregated in so many ways. The way to change that is by breaking down those barriers everywhere they exist, and it literally can just start with you. Over 70 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. How important or not important do you think it is to be reaching over the aisle and to be having those difficult conversations? I actually think that the state of politics at play right now is um, um, extreme, right? <laughs> Versus um, not extreme. They ain't gonna win. Don't want none of this. The liberals ain't gonna win. And I'm not sure what reconciliation looks like in that context because we're not having an honest conversation about what's happening. And so rather than talking about what it means to reach across the aisle, I think we actually have to talk about reestablishing the values of this country. What you're also saying is that you're coming from different places of what you believe the truth is. <laughs> and when you're disagreeing on what the facts are, then it's very difficult to That's right. start that conversation. That's right. What you would hope would be that this was a wake-up call for this country, and I fear that um, actually it's only the beginning. There have been protests in Louisville, Boston, and Atlanta where demonstrators shattered windows and tossed rocks into CNN's headquarters. The battle for racial equality has come with challenges. Just the name of Black Lives Matter can be a lightning rod of the right. For some, the hashtag heard around the world is synonymous with Antifa, the radical left, and burning cities. There have been a few recent studies that have come out to suggest that since the earlier days of um, you know, the mass protests that started in May since George Floyd's death, that some of the support for Black Lives Matter nationally has waned and deteriorated. I'm wondering whether you think that some of the images that have come out of these protests, like some of the vandalism, some of the riots, some of the arson, has undermined the movement? The vast majority of these protests are not destructive in the ways that they're being portrayed. And that when they do become destructive, that often it's not protesters. And that's an important story for us to tell. Over 90% of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations were peaceful. In fact, several violent incidents were instigated by counter-protesters, armed militias, and the police tasked with patrolling the protests. Investigators are pointing to white supremacist organizations as being responsible for some of the violence. But the damage was done, and many held Black Lives Matter responsible.
Obviously, there's a, a real divide between people who believe that there needs to be a complete overhaul of the police, and there's also people on the other side who believe that law and order is absolutely necessary in order to prevent cities from descending into utter chaos. What do you believe needs to happen with law and order? There's not a lot of evidence that cities are descending into chaos. For the most part, crime has been on a steady decline. And what we are seeing, though, is that we as a nation incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the world. I think we can all agree that guns and badges don't address that problem. Even law enforcement can agree with that. I don't that. think we can all agree on that. I well, think you're making an over-assumption to say I that we can all agree I on actually, that. I actually think that what connects us across those issues is that people feel like something's not working. What we disagree on is what the solution is. Can you understand, though, why it is that, you know, some people would be scared at these calls to defund the police when, you know, they're worried about increasing criminality or increasing people likely to break into their homes or whatever it is? What I do know is that we spend a lot of money on policing and it's not actually impacting the problem that we're trying to solve. I believe that there are a lot of people out there that think that Black Lives Matter is coming to take something from you. But is that true? No. Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization run by three avowed Marxists, go check. Black Lives Matter has been planning to destroy the police for three years. They've finally gotten stupid Democrat mayors to agree with them. We have an organization that is taking advantage of the fact that people don't really know what's behind a Marxist-driven organization. One thing that I notice in a lot of conservative media that comes up over and over and over is um, something that your co-founder said, Patrice Cullors, back in 2015, when she said, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. We are trained Marxists. I'm wondering what you'd say to people on the right who are scared that, you know, you guys are leading this radical agenda. I can almost promise you, <laughs> I can almost promise you that there is not a danger of there being a communist government in this country anytime soon. I've seen that quote so many times on Fox News, on Breitbart, on like every conservative medium that you can imagine. Can you understand why there is that fear of Marxism, of communism taking over the country? I don't actually, because as somebody who lives here in this country, I can say um, from my perspective, it looks like capitalism is alive and well. And I, I do think that a lot of this is about leading through scare tactics as opposed to leading through having a plan. There have been real consequences to these widening divisions. Just a few months ago, FBI agents visited Alicia to warn her of a suspected white supremacist who'd been arrested on weapons charges. Her name was on his list. Obviously, doing this work has come at a hefty price. What has been the personal cost of all this? Well, the cost of those stories is that they literally result in death threats. It results in people feeling like they have to take action to protect themselves. And this notion results in people taking matters into their own hands. There was a 17-year-old boy who was driven to a protest by his mother with an AK-47, and he shot three people and he killed two. And at no point in time has this president ever said, that's not okay. And when you have a platform that large and you don't correct yourself, um, these are stories that are allowed to proliferate. And that has a huge, huge, huge impact on how people see the organization, how people see this movement. I mean, I guess the criticism of that would be, why isn't there a stronger leadership to denounce that stuff? So that it's very clear what the direction is and what it's not. I think it's clear. I think that what we know is that Black Lives Matter is fighting for the dignity and the sanctity of Black life. And that nowhere in there, right, is any other call. Alicia has since stepped away from the day-to-day -day operations of Black Lives Matter. She's now the principal of Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund, organizations that work to empower Black communities at every level of government. Through these organizations, she's also worked on the largest census of Black people in America in over 150 years. 
I've had thousands of conversations about what they're experiencing every day, what they imagine for their futures, and how they can be a part of making that future real. The fact of the matter is Black people are migrants and we're citizens. We are formerly incarcerated, currently incarcerated, never incarcerated. We're Republicans and Democrats and independents and everything all in between. So our stories about Black people have to be more complex. And we set out to tell new stories by really talking with our communities and listening. My passion is really about making Black people powerful in the political process so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. Her efforts and those of others have been paying off. In the 2020 election, over 90% of Black Americans voted for Joe Biden. We believe that we deserve a political system that doesn't use us just as symbols. We know that we deserve substance from our political leaders and from our democracy. We really had our eyes on making sure that Donald Trump was a one-term president. We've gotten over that mountain for now. Mm -hmm. And also, we have a lot more work to do. As for the movement she helped create, Alicia is confident that this is just the beginning, with a long, hard-won road ahead. How does the Black Lives Matter movement continue to gain momentum despite all the, the backlash? What I know is that our communities are undeterred. And, you know, the question of how do we keep going is really like a livelihood question for us. So um, we don't have a choice. This moment will be described in history books as a time when um, this country had a deep, deep reckoning. And everything that you do in this moment is shaping that and is shaping our future, not just our present.